thank you very much for being on this call. Thank you for that very good introduction, Juliet. I now have to live up to it. Um, so today I'm giving a very interesting talk on a subject I never thought I'd fall in love with. If you told me a year ago that I'd be interested in doing anything that requires testing, I'd, I'd tell you you're mad. So it's a subject that I've come to love because I've come to understand the need of it. Let me share my screen so that I can start my talk. Kindly confirm if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yes, so my talk today will be on testing in Phoenix Live View. We'll look at the best practices on testing in Phoenix Live View applications, how to best test it, and most importantly, the reason of testing it. I'll give you a brief introduction about myself, uh, the fields I've been in. So I'm a software developer. Um, I have four years of experience. I started, started off with Ruby on Rails and later moved on to Alexa in the past year. I have now been working with Alexa for around a year. Um, I currently work full time at Body Consultants. We offer technical solutions um, with Alexa and Phoenix Live. And with my in my free time, I really love building and um, building up products and solutions for ideas that I have. You can find that on my on my link, michaelmunavu.com. If you have anything interesting, you can reach me out there. Let me go through now the things that we'll be covering in this section. So what we'll cover in this, uh, in this webinar is the first and the most important reason is why should we write test in live view? How do live view test work? What is the anatomy of a live view test? We'll go through a couple of code examples to see how to write live view test. We'll also look at how we can use factories to add the data when we're testing in live view. Uh, the two, the last two we'll be looking at are the best practices when testing live view, the bonus tips for debugging. So I'll just give you a brief history of my history with testing. Uh, when I was writing Ruby and Ruby on Rails, I had looked at RSpec testing for unit testing. And I had done that for you know probably two years. And I later moved on to Elixir. I started off in a company called GS1. It was not a very, very big team that we had. So I didn't see actually the need for testing because you'd find that you're building a whole application on yourself. Now, when I moved on to Kodi, where we are, we are a bigger team, you realize now the need for testing because Elixir is very functional. You'll find that um, there are very many functions defined that are being used in different modules. So you might come and uh, change, that function, change that function to suit the need that you currently have, and you've messed up a whole other module. So this is why live, live view tests are important. So you can imagine if um, a live view test had been written for that module X and you're changing a function that you want to use in module Y, if you run, just run the live view test, you can see that they break and there's a problem. Live view tests are also very interesting. They're not uh, similar to unit tests. I feel unit tests are very, very straightforward. They're very direct. In unit tests, you have a function. Testing it is just looking at whether that function does what it's supposed to do. When you're looking at live view testing, you're looking at the whole process um, of what happens when you mount on a Phoenix Live View page. And you're going to do a search when you're adding some data to a form. What actually happens? This is I, th I feel like live view tests are very very important, and this is where we'll we'll delve into into this talk. So first reason is why should we write tests in Live View? These are my top three. So it's correct code functionality. Just to verify that your live view components behave as expected under various conditions. The key thing here is under various conditions. Um, you may find that you build a component and it works very well because it's in its best condition, it's in its most optimal condition. You haven't thought of um, the million scenarios that may happen. You haven't thought about that user may, that may come and add a number to a text input. So when doing live view test, you can be able to simulate all these different instances that may take place in, in the process of you, someone interacting with your system. The other thing, it prevents regression. This mostly happens in big teams, whereby I can be able to ensure that the code that I've added doesn't mess up with any other module or any other function that is already defined there. Another thing is that it improves code quality. This is very interesting. When you think about it, to write live your test, 
you have to break down your code into the smallest of functions, the smallest and most testable functions. When I was starting out with live, you, um, Sigu um, advised me that I should be able to now write my code in the most simple and testable way possible. So in this way, I'm ensuring that your code is actually cleaner. Every time you test, your code becomes cleaner. We'll now move on to how live you test work. I really struggled with understanding this bit when I was starting out because I remember looking at the docs and I didn't actually understand what was happening. This is my analogy for it. This is how live you test work. Live you test is in a way a very, very stupid baby who has to go through your app and understand what's happening. When this baby sees a search button, all they care about is that when I search, for example, if I have a full database of names starting with M, I have a full database. The only thing I care about is if I type M, I can only see records starting with M. I don't care about the millions and billions of lines of code that have gone into making that happen. So you have to think of live you test that way. It's in a way just seeing how when a user interacts with your HTML and they click on a button and they hit a search bar, what happens? What happens to the HTML? So let's think about what now this stupid baby of ours really cares about. This stupid baby, if we have a counter here with plus, minus, and a value, all I care about is that value is zero, I hit plus, I see one. That's all I care about. I don't care about how that functionality is done. So you'll see that in live view, all I'm caring about is how the different events that I change make the HTML change. So we're looking at events in the space of hitting a button, in the name of um, going through a search bar, in the name of clicking a certain button. How does that affect the HTML that I'm looking at? So you should think about it that way. Let's look at the anatomy of a live view test. Um, most, if not all, of live view tests will look as such. This is how they look like. So it's in a way a four step process. The first step being you mount on the page, think about it as you're going on zoom.com. When you go on zoom.com, you mount on a page. The second thing is you are able to see a plus button. The thing is, when you're seeing a plus button, this is now selecting an element. So the second thing is selecting an element. The third thing is having a render effect, having a render change on the element. So you can think of this as I go to zoom.com. The first thing is the page mounts. The second thing is that I see the button. The third thing is that I hit the button. So you can either hit the button, you can blur the button, you can hold on the button. So this is a, these are changes that we are doing on these elements that we've selected. The last thing is that we are asserting. So in assertions, think of it like I have said that when I do this, this is what I expect. So this is all that assertions are. Yes, so as I've said, let's break in the, them down into four. The first one being you mount on the page, select an element that's on the page, you perform a render action, and you assert that that render action has made your HTML change in one way or the other. Let's look at code examples. Um, when I interact with most software, I the render actions that I mostly interact with are either I'm clicking a button, either I'm changing a form, or either I'm submitting a form. So you look at these three, but when you go to the library documentation on the test section, you'll see that we, we have the ability to test for so many things that you can look at here. We have render click, render focus, render blur, render submit, render change, render key down, render key up, and render hook, amongst many others. But currently, we'll focus on render click, render submit, and render change, as I feel like those are the most used. Um, by software developers who are writing in Elixir and who are actually writing in any other language. Render click. Render click, I feel, is so basic. This is a click event that occurs on a page when you hit a button on a, or an element with a PHX click event attached to it. Um, now, when you're writing a live view test to simulate the PHX click event, you'll just be uh, writing the helper render click. Now, in this, remember our baby is very, very stupid. That's all you have to remember. So you have to specify on which element exactly you're you're selecting that you want to click on. So you'll see that when you're writing uh, the render click helper, you have to specify which button you're selecting. And you can specify this either by ID or by the text content that is in that div or button or element. 
let's build a simple counter. So in building a simple counter, let's think about it very logically. When, let's say you're building a, your first um, calculator app. When you're building your first calculator app, it was very straightforward. Have a button here. You have two buttons, let's say a plus and a minus, and the value that's zero. If I click the plus button, the value becomes one. If I click the plus button again, the value becomes two. If I click the minus button, the value becomes one. So it's very straightforward. How do you think about this in live view testing? First, let's look at the logic, how you direct this in Phoenix Live View. So the logic here will be, as I've said, when you mount into the page, supposed to see a value, and in this case, it will be a default of zero. As you can see here, we have a handle event function here that is called a new increment. And what it does is that it assigns the count variable to the count plus one. We have a decrement handle event decrement here that assigns the count variable to count minus one. So that's very straightforward. When you look at the HTML, we have a paragraph here with an ID of counts. Inside it, you have the variable count that will default to zero when you mount onto the page. Um, we now have two buttons here, each with a PHX click attributes. First one being increment with an ID of increment. The second one being decrement with a ID of decrement. But here's something very important that you need to look at. As you can see here, I have specified on the elements that I'll be interacting with in my live view in my test that I'm giving them an ID. This ID just ensure that it's very, very easy for me to, to look for them in my live view test. If I didn't have the ID, um, I'd essentially just be looking for a value that's zero, but I don't know exactly where it is. And you can imagine if I have so many zeros in, in, my, in my live view, it will be very hard for me to specify which zero is changing when I hit the plus button. So this is something that's very, very important. It's a, it's a key thing that you have to look at. When you're dealing with live view tests, if you know the elements that you'll be interacting with, it's very, very important to give them an ID, a unique ID that you can be able to call them with in the live view test. Now let's write some pseudocode of um, how live view test will actually look like. If you remember the anatomy, we had um, first thing is you mount in the page. Second thing is you select the element you want to change. Third thing is you apply a render action. The fourth thing is you assert that something has changed. So if you look at the increment, if you're testing the increment function, this is how it will look like. So the first thing is I mount on the page. I go to the home page. Second thing is look for the count and you expect it to be a zero. So you can do an assertion here. The next thing is I look for the increment button and I click it. Last thing is I assert that now this value here became one. It's very straightforward. If you break it down in four simple steps, it will be very, very easy for you to write any live test. If you look at the decrement function here, the same thing, you go to the home page, look for the count, which should be zero, look for the decrement button, click it, uh, you look for the count, now it should be minus one. Now let's look at how the actual code, how the actual code looks like. As I said, you can select either by element and content. Sorry. As I said, you can either select by element or content, but I personally prefer or I'd advise even to look at selecting it by ID. So you can see that even if you select by element and content, can you imagine if we had, let's say even a calculator where you have very many numbers and you need to define that when I press this zero and I'm not pressing a zero that's somewhere else, that's the one I'm expecting to change. So if you're looking at selecting by element and content, this is how it will be like. So the first thing is that I mount in the page, which is uh, the root page. I assert that this HTML has a value of zero. Then I go to the live view. I look for the element and then the elements now, I select it with the element's name and the content that's inside it. Then I render a click action and now I expect this HTML to have a value of one. So it's very straightforward. If you can break it down, all your live test into those four simple steps, it becomes very, very easy. If you're looking at, um, this is increments a counter. Yes, so you can either select by element and content. If you're selecting by ID, here you can just select um, with the ID of increments, you render a click and the HTML changes to one. 
not the decrement. So the decrement is the same. In this case, you can expect that if you hit this pattern twice, I expect to have minus two instead of minus one. So the same thing. So mount onto the page, you assert that this HTML, it's zero. I'm not going to the view. In the view, I'm using the element helper, select a button with the decrement text content. I'm having a render click action. So that's a first click. For the second click, I'm having a HTML variable attached to it, such that I can be able to call it down here. So I have, I'm going to the view. I'm selecting the decrements by ID now. I'm rendering a click action, and now the HTML has minus two. Let's now look at render change. Um, render change mostly occurs when you're dealing with forms, or it actually mostly occurs when you're dealing with forms. You can think of it when you're dealing with filters, but it will mostly occur when you're dealing with forms. PSX change is called when a change event occurs on the page. When you change an element with a PHX change event attached to it on our live view test, the same as render change. Here we'll use it mostly in forms. In render change, all you have to worry about is how we pass our params, as you will see. So let's think about a simple search feature. A simple search feature, if you're making it very stupid for a very stupid baby, if I go to a page and I have a search bar, it doesn't matter which um, language or framework um, that system is built in, but I expect to see if I, can, I search for Mike, I, I see Michael and I don't see Kevin. That's all I expect. So if I have a database with Michael, Kevin, and Joseph, I expect that if I start typing M-I-C-H, I can be able to see only Michael. That's all my stupid baby cares about. When you're live, you test, you have to ensure that that's all you care about. So you don't care about how that search functionality works, as you'll see. Now, in as I've mentioned, I'm looking at things like forms, even to, to, to see this, um, being able to be tested, you have to have some data of some sort. I've said if you're having a, a live view system or any other system and you want to implement, let's say, a search function or a search feature, you have to have some data. And for that, we use factories. So factories help us insert test data into our live view app when you're when you're writing our test to be able to simulate um, what's happening in our actual live view test, in our actual live view. Factories provide convenience functions for producing different groups of data. They work exactly as factories do. We build things there, so in this case, we'll be building some data. For example, we may need to build a user or some post. For this, um, we'll create a file in our test slash support and call it factory.ex. In our factory.ex, this is how basic uh, factory file looks like. We have a build function here, and it takes in the post parameter. So every time you call factory.build post, this is what it will do. It will come to the post and it will add a default title and a default description. As you can see here, you can either not pass any attributes or you can decide to pass an attribute. So you can say, for example, I want to add this post with a title test. So if I just say factory.insert post, it will do this. It will just give me this type. This is a title and this is a description. If I call factory.insert post and I pass in the second argument as I'm up with title and test, it will now give me title as test and description as this is the description. Now let us work on our or our, on our search feature. With factory now, we can be able to set up um, let's say a post blog application that you can test the search functionality with. Okay, how will the logic um, of this look like? So same thing. First thing is you mount on the page. So if you mount on the page, we have a change set here that you've assigned post to change post. And on the post, they're listing all the posts. Then we, hand up, we have a handle event function here called search. The params that it takes is post and search. Then we're taking this variable here as query. Then over here, we are performing some magic and it will return to us the posts that are filtered. As I've said, now in our live view test, we don't care about this whole magic that's performed. If you've written live, you'll understand that you can be able to do a such functionality in so many ways. You can uh, set it in state. You can be able to have it as, as like this. You can push it to the params in the URL and have it there and have a handle params function. Then use that value to check if there's any other value like that in the database. 
my stupid baby does not care about that. All my stupid baby cares about is I have Michael, Joseph, and Ken. I search for M I C H. Michael is the only thing I see. The HTML for this will just be a div here with a form where I can be able to search. And over here, I'm just looping through all my posts and listing the title and the description. Now, let's look at how we test for this. So in testing for this, we'd had to first set it up. In setting it up, think about it as when you're adding, when you're doing a search feature, you have to first add some data into your, into your database. So a setup is exactly that. So in a setup, you're essentially now having some data that is already there that you can use in your library test. So as you can see here in post one, we are using the factory that I mentioned and you're building the first post and in the post two, you're building the second post and you're passing them down. If you come to our test over here, we have, once you search for a post, you get a filtered result of the post matching the searched term. You're passing down post one and post two, and you're not breaking down them down into the four. So the first one being you mount onto the page, the second one being select an item, the third one being perform a render action, the fourth one being your cert. So the first one is you mount onto the page, mounting onto slash post. We are asserting that when you go there, you'll find the first post and the second post. After that, we are selecting this form. And I'll show you examples of how to best select this form. So selecting a form with the ID of search post filter, and you're passing this as a second argument. And as I said, when you're looking at um, render change in render submit, you'll have to be very, very careful about how you pass this second parameter. And I'll show you how. Then you do a render action, so you render change. After I do this, I expect that my searched HTML has the first post, and I'm refuting that my search HTML has the first the second post, as in the search parameters have only passed in F1 or F F I the first. Um, let me now explain to you how the second you get the second argument. Now, if you have a handle event function that looks like this, where you have the post, you have the post, the search, and now the query that you want to look like to, to take up to take here. What you just do in the second argument, you'll take this post, bring it here, and just have this map as it is. So you'll have the search and the query that you're passing here. If, for example, um, the params that I was taking here were game, name, and a certain value or a variable here, this is how it will look like. So I'd have the game here and the map over here. So this is very, very important when you're looking at dealing with forms or dealing with anything that you have to change or submit. Now, the last one that I'll look into uh, in detail is, is render submits. So in render submits, this function is, this is called when a submit event occurs on, on the page. When you submit a form with a PHX submit event attached to it, on our live view test, it is the same as render submits. We'll use this in form. And in this case, actually, we'll just look at the same search functionality that we had. So in this search functionality, we'll just add a button such that instead of, um, that function being called every time we there's a change action, it will be called only when there's a submit action. So as you can see here, it's the same thing I've said that now instead of PHX change, I have PHX submit, it will call the search handle event. So the setup will be the same whereby I insert the first post, I insert the second post, I pass them down. I take them here as the first post and the second post. And now I go, the first thing is I go to my post page. I can be able to see that I have the first post and the second post. When I go to my form selector, I can be able to select the same form and be able to pass in the same parameters. And here now instead of render change, I write render submit, which will now call a submit action. And now after you do that, you expect that you find the first post and you don't see the second post. So now I look into the best practices. As I've said, it is very important for our stupid baby to understand which elements they'll be going to look at. So it's very, very, very important. And I insist on this to give your elements IDs. If you're looking at looping, ensure that you can have something like probably that takes the ID. So if you're looping a group of 
artist you can have the first artist artist having artist one something artist two something that can be very very easy for you not to test live your test or to do live your test on these different elements the next thing is test html not html structure i'll read that again test html and not html structure i'll stop this by sigu um sigumago when he mentioned that i don't know there's a time i had written a test and it had I was asserting that there will be a span next to a paragraph. So told me the best thing is just to ensure there will be a content in the span next to that paragraph. Because someone may come and change, instead of having that span, uh, they may put a div or a paragraph and your library test will fail. So it's very, very important to test HTML and not HTML structure. Now I'll move into bonus tips. This is a very interesting, interesting part. One of my favorite ones is um, the open browser that, uh, that I just found out recently, actually. So this would have helped me a lot if I knew it when I was starting out. So this can open the view that you're actually testing and in its actual state. So if you're testing and seeing, uh, I have this such, such functionality in my test database, I have Michael, Joseph, and Ken. When I write M-I-C-H, you can open the browser and see now how that live view looks like. Just this is how now you'd, you'd call it. So you'd have the index live. I go to this form. In this form, there is I select this. I select a form with the ID of search post filter. I pass in the second parameter and I open the browser. So you can see now how this will look like. All I have to do is run mix test. This is how this is a video explanation. Yeah, so as you've seen, I went onto the page, I selected the element, the ID increment, I had a click uh, event on it, now when I open the browser, I see one. So it can help you now in your sessions to ensure that you assert that there is one. This is very, very amazing. Look at um, my second bonus tip. This is one that I really love. You can use has element to pass in the view uh the selector and the text filter but it's optional so this is how that will look like so you can assert that this element you can assert that uh in this live view it has an element um with the id of one or with the id of count that has a text content of one so this is very very helpful in your sessions um another thing that i also stumbled on recently is that when you're dealing with links and you want to test for a feature like when you click the link, you're taken to a certain page, you may get an error that the element does not have a click attribute. The fix for this is just adding the element's name after you select it via its ID as such. So you can think about this like uh, you want to test when you click on an element, you're taken to a different page, that element will probably not have a PHX click action. It will just be either an A tag or a live redirect or a live patch. So for you to be able to test this, if you write it like this, so you just have the elements, the ID, and um, the text content, if you run a click, you'll get an error telling you that the element does not have a PHX click attributes. So how to fix this is just when you're selecting the element, pick its ID, give it a space, and the element's name. So if you have an A tag or a button, then you add the name, you run a click action, and now 
this live is just in post. Um, another thing is that when you're dealing with form redirects, you use the follow redirect. Um, this will be if you let's say you have a pop-up after filling the form, you are redirected back to a certain page. This flow returns a tuple of OK, the view, and the HTML, which will look something like this. So if, for example, um, I'm going to a live page, I'm selecting this form, I'm passing these attributes, I am submitting the form. So after submitting the form, if I'm redirected back, I use the follow redirect helper, and this will return to me now a tuple of OK, live, and HTML. So I can now see that, let's say this HTML will now have this 10 and this 20, I can well, I start with uh, something in this slide. Um, thank you very much. That was my talk. The slides of this talk have been uploaded in this link that I will share in the group. Um, thank you very much. I believe now is question time. So if you have any questions, now is the time. Thank you very much. Do you have any insights or experiences regarding uh, continuous integration and deployment pipelines for Phoenix Lively projects, particularly in relation to testing? Um, yes. So what you currently have, what you currently use at work is GitHub Actions. So you set your actions such that uh, they have to pass a certain test or they have the test have to work essentially for that branch to even be considered for a PR. So actually, that's the thing that pushed me into, into library testing was that we have this new rule that for every pull request that you're submitting, the test have to pass. So you can just add um, a GitHub action. I'll actually be writing an article for that soon. So you have just have um, a GitHub action for that, such that every time you're pushing some code either to production or to, to GitHub, um, it's checking if all the, library, all the, all the tests are passing. So it's unit test, live view test, all the pass, all the tests have to pass for let's say that branch to be considered. Are there any, any, any other questions? Thank you, Paul. Best resources to learn Elixir. Um let me share a link of, let me just share a link. There's a, there's a website called Elixir Phoenix Ash that I use that's pretty nice. But old advice, for me, how I learned Elixir was mostly building Phoenix then having to come back and learn Elixir. Then I'd probably say having uh, reading books. There's a very good book on Elixir called The Pragmatic Software Engineer. So if you can, if you can get your hands on that book, that's pretty good. Uh, you can reach out to me on my website and I can show you through the book. It's very, very good for learning Alexa. Then your transition to Phoenix will be very easy. Mostly if you have a background in something like Ruby, they're very, very similar. <laughs>